Our scripture this morning comes from Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 21. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly, from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as a fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit enabled them. Now there, was, there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. At this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native tongue? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jewish and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. In our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others sneered and said, they are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you, and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy, and your old men shall see visions, and your, uh, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in heaven above, and signs on earth below, blood and fire, and smoky mist, the sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. There's a lot going on here today, so I'm going to try to keep it focused. <laughs> I'm going to give you the three points to start the sermon, okay? So there are three points in this sermon. It's see, hear, and speak. So see. We need a little background on this situation here. We are in the book of Acts. The disciples of Christ are gathered in a room. But why are they gathered? Well, Pentecost is not actually a Christian holiday that was invented by the church. It's uh, the first holiday that the church kind of hijacked, frankly. Pentecost is uh, the holiday that happens, uh, penta meaning 50, 50 days following the Passover. So this is the Feast of Weeks. This is a traditional Jewish holiday. This is why they were gathered for Pentecost. They were in one room celebrating, likely, the Feast of Weeks. During this feast, traditionally, they celebrated, so if Passover was the deliverance of God's people out of Egypt, 50 days later, they would have been uh, at the Mount Sinai. They would have been receiving the law of Moses from God. So this was traditionally a feast where they would get together 50 days following Passover to celebrate the law, the law of God, the law that made them God's people, the law that set them apart. It was also a feast that they would invite everybody that was nearby, anybody who was in the area to come and join them. So it was a Jewish feast to celebrate their Jewishness and to invite everybody to come and see and learn about their Jewishness. 
This is why they were gathered. 50 days after Passover, also happens to be roughly 50 days when after Jesus res was resurrected from the dead, right? This happened at the same time. So the church hijacked Pentecost. 50 days afterward, after Jesus' death and resurrection, Jesus has now since ascended into heaven and the disciples are in Jerusalem. They're hanging out. They're pouting a little. They're kind of hiding. I mean, remember, Jesus was crucified. There, there are people looking for them. So they're probably doing a little hiding. Pentecost was that day when they were together and then Christ's, uh, Christ's ministry, death, resurrection, life, all of these things that had been reframing the laws. Jesus has spent his entire time telling the people of God, the laws are not here for us to follow. The laws are to make us God's people. He had spent his entire ministry reframing the law, right? Reframing that law of Moses so that it could be inclusive of those who are beyond just the Jewish people, so that we could live lives that follow this law, that set us apart without fear of not being able to be forgiven, of not following these laws. We're not able to follow all the laws of God perfectly. So there was a need for us to find a way to live this law that set us apart and yet find forgiveness. And so Christ fulfilled that. So in his entire life, Jesus has been reframing the law for God's people. In doing so, having this holiday, this holiday when we celebrate the laws of Moses, celebrate the laws that set us apart, these laws that Jesus has been spending his entire time, his entire life, reframing, we have Pentecost being that moment when the church is truly installed, truly initiated into its work of proclaiming salvation through Christ. This is ground zero for the church. This is the work of the church to proclaim that we are God's people, we are set apart, and that Christ has set it up in such a way that we can fulfill this law. This is good news. And it's Pentecost, so all these people are going to be around. It's a, a feast where we are inviting everyone to join us, slaves or free, male or female, visitors, foreigners, everyone was invited to this feast. This feast is reinterpreted. And so this is this opportunity, Pentecost, where we get to see the unity, the union. We see the unity of the church in Pentecost. Pentecost is that day when we celebrate the birth of the church, hence the balloons. Um, it's the birthday of the church. It's ground zero for the church. It's where we all, regardless of what our faith tradition is, can trace back our roots to. We have unity in the church, and so that is what we see. We see unity. Second point, we listen. We listen to others. Pentecost is that day. We have many people in the city of Jerusalem for the Feast of Pentecost, the Feast of Weeks. So the city was, it was already a city full of many people from many backgrounds, but it was even more full of people from all over the known world who had come, who had Jewish traditions, Jewish roots, and come back to celebrate. This was before the days of Google Translate. This was before the days of your translation dictionaries online, and it was before the days people carried around translation dictionaries. I had, does anybody, did anybody own one of these things, a translation dictionary, English to, yeah, Brazil, <laughs> right? And I studied French, and so I had one of these in my backpack for years. Um, they're only helpful if you're in a community that speaks that standard language, right? There are many dialects in this world. Uh, there are many dialects in English. There are many dialects in the United States. If you talk to someone from the hollers of, you know, West Kentucky, it's going to sound and 
be a little bit of a different English hit than if you talk to someone from the Bronx or if you talk to someone from Indianapolis. There's a different twang, if you will, to that voice and there's words that are different. And we have the internet, we have television, we have all kinds of media that neutralize the experience or the understanding of, of English. In Jesus' day, they did not have that. Therefore, every village could have their own dialect. Every little town, every little community would have their own words that they would use. Sure, they were speaking similar languages, but they were very different dialects. So, if we apply this to our story here, to the, what we're reading in Acts chapter one and two. So, if you look in cha chapter one, we read that there were about 120 people. If everybody in the church was gathered, all of the disciples of Christ with the, apostle, with the apostles, there were about 120 people. If all 120 people were there, in that room at the beginning of Acts chapter two, which it does say they were all gathered together, so we'll say 120. Then, once they went out into the streets, proclaiming the good news in tongues, there would have been 120 voices, could have been 120 different languages being spoken. If you read down further in Acts chapter two, it says that 3,000 people were added to their number that day. That's a lot of people. It is very likely that's a lot more people and languages and dialects than 120. So what does this mean? Well, it, it, it means that in one sense, there, there's a miracle here in that they were speaking in tongues, absolutely. And there were a lot of very different languages that were run through. When I ran through that list of places that none of us could really un point out on a map, maybe a couple of them, there were a lot of different languages. But the miracle is, not only did people hear, or sorry, not only were they speaking in tongues, but they also heard and listened to what was being said. They heard in their own tongues, in their own native dialects, what was being said. And they listened. And that second part may actually be the bigger miracle if we think of our own context today. We might not be listening. How often do we listen? We hear, but how often do we listen? The Pentecost miracle is that people heard and understood and listened. Regardless of the background, the history, the bias, the angle of whomever was speaking and whatever they brought with them. In a world full of division and political partisanship and all of this thing, these things, and this, this is true today, and it was true then, the Holy Spirit can still speak to us and through us and into our lives. The third point was say. It's meant to be in con not in contrast. Uh, it's, it's not to counter the last point that we need to be listening and hearing. But the disciples, the disciples had been hiding a lot at this point in, in their story in the book of Acts. The, they had been in private spaces. They had locked themselves in rooms at times. Jesus found them before his ascension when he was visiting them. More often than not, he would find them locked up in a room or running from one place to another. He often would tell them their job now is to go out into the world and say this good news, to proclaim the good news. they would still find themselves locked up. Yet this passage, while it begins with the disciples in a room together, it's striking that suddenly they're out in the streets. That wind comes into that room, a loud, violent wind, and suddenly they're preaching in the streets. Jesus had promised to send his spirit 
And when he sent his spirit, that spirit blew through the room and in such a way blew them out into the streets and forced them to go out. So this story is not only about listening. It's not only about seeing our unity, but it's also about going out and proclaiming it. Going out into the world and enacting the life of the church. Going out into the world and being that community of believers that we're called to be. So, see the unity in the, denomina or in the church, that common denominator. Regardless of our, de our denomination, our experience, our background, we need to remember that we, have the, we see that unity. We need to hear and listen to what the Holy Spirit is interpreting in our midst, and we need to say what the Holy Spirit has for us to say. We cannot keep it to ourselves, keep it within our walls. We need to go out and do and proclaim the work of the, of the work that Jesus has given to the church. May the Holy Spirit fill each of us with the Father's wisdom, the Son's patience, and the boldness of her very own to go out and serve. Amen.